Welcome back to Gardening with Ryan. We've got some exciting updates on the garden from last time, but we've also got stuff to talk about. Today's discussion will by no means be a thorough... We're going to start by just watering all the potted plants. Today's discussion will be by no means a thorough treatment of this topic. However, I would like to get the ball rolling on this one. The topic is going to be... Is Protestant soteriology the heart of the gospel? Now, that can mean a lot of things. So I'm going to get into it. Let's go back to the Reformation. And rather than arguing about who thought what at what period of time, let's look at official pronouncements. So, we will start with the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Council of Trent. Nobody is declared righteous apart from actual infused righteousness. Now, for sake of ease of discussion, I'm going to be talking about salvation in two aspects. Here are two categories, ontological and forensic. When I say ontological, I'm talking about something that actually changes you as a being. When I say forensic, I am talking about a legal declaration that is completely outside of you. The Roman Catholic doctrine is that God's forensic just declaration of just is always accompanied by transforming grace of that justice. And that's the main issue that uh, Protestants have. In the Protestant doctrine, a person is justified by grace through faith alone, and... Apart from works. Now, I'd like to shift the gear of this discussion a little bit. Having been both a devout Roman Catholic layman and a devout Reformed layman, uh, I know I can't speak perfectly for these traditions, nor do I claim to represent perfectly, but I'm going to lay out an example. Let's say you're a Roman Catholic. Justification and final salvation and getting into heaven are by believing in God and obeying his commandments. I mean, there are many catechism citations, whatever. I, I, for, 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 I mean, for, uh, by the grace of Christ and the sacraments, of course, by obedience to God's commandments as given through the church. And I'm not saying that as derogatory. I love my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters in Christ, so I'm not saying that as derogatory. Okay. Now, you have a reformed paradigm. No. That's a false gospel because that teaches that you need to do works to be saved. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, to be justified. However, I want everyone to recall the final salvation controversy. And if you don't know much about the final salvation controversy... I would look into that uh, because the rest of this video won't make very much sense unless you've learned about it. I would look into R. Scott Clark, what he said about it, John Piper, Mark Jones. So, we have the other scheme. You are put into a right relationship with God by grace through faith alone. 
final salvation, or entrance to heaven, or salvation broadly, broadly speaking, in the Ordo Salutis, however, cannot be spoken of as by faith alone. Or as, um, okay, some theonomist theologian, and I know theonomists don't speak for the Reformed tradition here, but um, he had a quote that, that I found helpful for summarizing the position talked about how sanctification is by cooperation and if you want to see how mixed everyone is on this in the protestant world i want you to just google is sanctification by faith alone and you'll see a giant war so we all find ourselves in the reality that we both need to be delivered from sin in the sense of the punishment due to it and we have an actual problem like ontologically speaking, physically speaking, we need this stuff out of us. Heaven is not going to be heaven unless we are made into something that's not corrupt, right? So, you have the Reformed saying, the Roman Catholic saying, salvation, justification, and sanctification is by works. And then the Reformed say, no, 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 no. Actually, in the Ordo Salutis, regeneration is immediate, and then justification is prior to obedience and sanctification in the Ordo Salutis. All of this brings me to a question. Isn't that a pretty esoteric distinction that only a dweeb can really understand when it's like, no, no, no. The heart of saving the gospel is that um, what you have placed into the justification in the category of salvation, we are placing into the sanctification category of salvation, yet it's still part of salvation. Unless you're a total dweeb, I fail to see how that makes like any difference to a layperson. Now, I know there are groups, lots of them, which I'm dialoguing with and coming to understand as I navigate my way through this whole thing, that don't teach that. Like, uh, people that would identify as radical Lutherans and such, and some Baptists, and I, I know it's not an exclusive Protestant thing to say, um the same thing. However, what I'm essentially getting at is in a Protestantism defined as like American evangelicalism slash the reformed world slash Napark, that, uh, that whole crowd, um, I guess you have a pretty much universal agreement uh, I guess there's the whole Lordship Salvation controversy, but we're going to ignore that. Um, that's why I say there are people on like different sides of this, but there's a pretty much universal agreement that part of salvation, even if it doesn't have to do with your legal standing, is indeed being transformed in this life in part of being uh, prepared for completion of glorification, usually taught as instantaneously after death. Now, my thoughts are that unless you're a nerd, you don't even know what what people are talking about with this. Like, what, what difference could it? What difference does it make to you if it's in the transformative or legal category? Did we really save the gospel by putting different parts of salvation into the right soteriological categories? Uh, look at the soteriology of Christians throughout history and ask if most of them would at, would pass the salvation tests that uh, Protestants tend to give today as their theology exam. Is the Romans road, um, you're a sinner, you're in trouble, someone took your place, a formula, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, I'm just saying, is that formula really just a recovery of the gospel, like, you know, when Luther saved the world from the papists, 
see, because if you have both saying that salvation is in some sense by works, and if you don't believe me that people are saying that, I'll quote John Piper, salvation is not by faith. Kill your sin. Just look up that quote, and you'll see that it's John Piper. Mark Jones wrote in defense of John Piper on that, and then R. Scott Clark came back hard, our sanctification is by faith. My point is, the fact is, there's no consensus in the Reformed world on this. If you can't have a consensus on the divisions that you claim are a saving of the gospel, there's probably an issue, right? And... All of this is just a longer version of me expressing my grievance with the state of converting to Christianity today. Because I'm a convert, and the experience of myself and most other converts is, okay, when you decide to be a Christian, you're expected to figure, to learn, your, learn some theology and enter the theological uh, war zone. And uh, picking a tradition is loaded, and you're expected to be able to fight for it and wreck the others. And uh, it's not sustainable. Denomination hopping, of which I'm a serial guilty party, it... it it's not. It's it's not sustainable. It's not good. It's a it's a it's a product of. I think it's a product of technology, and that's okay. And technology is not a bad thing. I just think we need to use it right. And I think a lot of scholarship is going to be done that will likely resolve a lot of these issues because there are a lot of pra there's a lot of practical need for these things to be addressed. Even beyond just discussions of like dweeby things, there's a lot of practical need because people are hopping from denomination to denomination wondering what intellectual formula they can put in to get the get salvation out like God is a computer and you need to put the right uh arguments in for it to spit out the result you want. And a lot of people, like myself, probably have arrived at the point of what? how much systematic theology must I learn to be saved? That's not the biblical message. And I'm not speaking against Reformed Christianity here. I'm not speaking against Roman Catholicism here. I'm not speaking against any group here, I'm just saying that the, the landscape of hey, let's fight, let's go, when someone is interested, won't work. And interestingly, in the Reformed world and such, there's not a consensus on where Roman Catholics stand and other groups. And if you're going to anathematize somebody and say that someone's not a Christian over something, you better have very well-defined lines for that. And if you have those lines, that's fine. At least there's lines and consistency, you know? It's just... Ever since the Reformation, the churches have only become more splintered. And churches that, like Reformed and Lutheran churches and such stuff that represented states and represented areas and lines of thought, have only split and are continuing to split. And this current system, especially with all the pandemic stuff, it won't survive. But crisis promises church will survive. I just, I just don't know how that's going to happen. I mean, we'll find out. Lord willing, I'm here long enough, but... Anyway, exciting updates on the garden. Remember this thing? Well, we were gauging it if it was doing well by if it was tall enough, but it, it started like this, and now it's hanging, so this one's doing really well. We got that little tree growing in here. But that's all secondary, that's all secondary. Let me get to the real exciting part after I finish these, uh, these pots.
I'll get to the, I'll get to the gold. So you know how I wanted this area to be more green? Check it. Grass, grass, grass. It's hard to see, but there's little green grass sprouts coming up pretty much everywhere. And just like vegetative growth and such just popping up a lot around all this area. Now, it'll be slow, but if we keep it wet, this whole area will be just green. Remember in previous episodes how all this was dead? Well, I watered it and brought it to the rim. We're gonna try and do the same right here with this big patch of same miscolored that is. And the lawn seems to be doing alright, honestly. Doesn't need much work. However, last time I was out here watering, wasn't filming. Sorry. I was in a hurry. I watered over here to try to promote more further grass growth back up here. Look at that. That's fantastic. Let's keep it going. Anyway, back on topic. It's at, right now. It's as if you need to ascent to basically salvation from my point of view in the in the Christian polemicism sphere or whatever. And discussions has been largely reduced to. Checking if someone's a Christian has been reduced to asking them about a lot of esoteric theological distinctions that most people throughout history that have been Christians would have never heard of. And that's probably not ideal. Uh, do I know what the solutions are? No. Am I here, like, to teach you any doctrine or be a teacher? No. Just here pointing out what I see as a big issue. And it's not going to go away. And, um, as far as the Eastern Orthodox go, I think what I would like from them, if they're listening and they're like, how can we be better understood, how can we reach people, I can tell you from my Western mindset. When I try to learn about Eastern Orthodoxy, there's a very... It's hard to find exactly what is taught and what isn't officially because you have kind of like the American hipster docs, you've got the traditionals, you've got people all over the place. You've got Timothy Ware's like the intro textbook and stuff, and I'm like... Okay. If you if there could because we find ourselves in a landscape where people want to know where people land theologically, right? And I understand that neo Palamism broadly speaking, and Palamism just broadly speaking is the theology of Eastern Orthodoxy and like if you read the if you read the uh, I actually forget what the collection of all those monks is called that um, 
the Hezzy Cast Monk compilation. I'll remember it after I film this, and then you guys know what I'm talking about, but, um... I think the hesychasm controversy is being swept under the rug. But I think it's actually still really relevant, and I know you might think I'm a hipster for that, but I think it has a lot to do with doctrines of God and how people perceive God and how people go about their spiritual life, and, you know, I'm going to recommend some resources for this that I might get flamed for, but just to see two people ferociously go at both sides for the best Roman Catholic treatment I have seen of it, most Holy Family Monasteries videos about Eastern Orthodoxy. They're Sedevacantist monks. However, their scholasticism is actually pretty impressive. Especially their video. Um, the, the best one I, I saw was the one that they did on the Filioque. And then, from the other side, I would recommend seeing the counter brought forth by Jay Dyer. Jay Dyer is a very controversial figure, I know, but he is very familiar with Palamas and is among the group that contends that Maximus the Confessor explicitly taught the energy essence distinction the same way that Palamas did in the Hesychast controversies. So, if you want to see both sides, I would go there. And, of course, Palamas, Triads, Maximus the Confessor. This is Maximus the Confessor dealing with Christological issues, by the way. Um, issues such as uh, wills and Christ and such. And um, for those who don't know, uh, monothelitism is the belief that there is only one will in Christ, which was condemned as a heresy because... Um, Will is something that belongs to a nature rather than a person, and it was monothelitism was sort of a softened monophysitism, the belief that Christ only has one nature, which is divine and human mixed, or only divine, regardless, depending on how you formulate it. And speaking of that. The Church of the East has split into a few ch tiny churches, and then you've got the people that are in communion with Rome, and they're not really trying to do evangelism or anything, so, like, I don't think anyone's really worried about them, except for ecumenical purposes, like, how do we treat them, which is good, which is good. Are they actually Nestorians? Well, they revere St. Nestorius, but, like, not really. I don't think. I actually don't think they're Nestorians. And I don't buy the whole Nestorius wasn't a Nestorian line. I just actually don't think that they're Nestorians. But um, my Aphysites, I don't actually see the difference between them and uh, on the doctrine of Christology. I don't see a fundamental difference between them and Diophysites. Because... In my physicism, they make it very clear that the natures are the natures, and that the human nature of Christ is human, and his divinity is divine, and this humanity never becomes divinity, and his divinity never becomes humanity. And to me, it seems like... Okay. We have to admit, and everyone will admit, that language for distinction between person and essence was sloppy initially. Hypostasis was used for both, and the word for essence was used for both. So, we have that issue, and we have things going through translation and stuff. And in my unprofessional evaluation, 
the words person and nature got very confused. Now, in the case of Nestorius and such, I don't give a pass. Because, well, it's simple. Did Mary give birth to God? That was his main contention. Theotokos, right? Well, people might think that's like a Marian thing primarily, but... Okay, let me, let me ask this. Did she raise God? Who'd they crucify? Did they crucify God? Yes, they did. That's our faith. That God became man for us. So when you deny Mary the title Mother of God, well, who's she the mother of then if he's not God? So, although their modern church is not Nestorian, I don't think, because they've, they've had joint declarations and such... I just think Nestorius was a Nestorian. <laughs> Shocking, right? Nestorius a Nestorian? But I see so many like pro Nestorius stuff. Anyway, it's getting kinda cold. And I don't know how many of the people who watch the gardening theology videos watch the programming videos, but I need to go learn how to compile to a new architecture, so I will catch you guys in the next one.